Hey, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the 8 times Chumley and the crew screwed over customers on Pawn Stars. If you're a fan of Pawn Stars, make sure to leave a like on the video. Also, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you can be notified when we release our daily videos. Now with all that being said, let's get right to the video. Number 1. Book from Isaac Newton's Library among themselves and they didn't want the public to know and it was very important influence on later scientists notably isaac newton used this a lot it was his when a dealer from season three comes in with a duplicate of a 450 year old book on chemistry he claims is from isaac newton's the old man realized he has something extraordinary on his hands obviously he brings in bookmaster gary who verifies that it is a book from a well-known scholar despite its poor condition still gary puts the estimate of the book at twenty thousand. Incredibly, Chumley at that point acknowledges the old man amazingly low idea of 7,000. Just to put a bow on this arrangement, it turns out that part of the book was destroyed or filed in Britain. In reality, this book is a valuable bit of history. From Chemicum Britannicum. I bought the book several years ago from an antiquarian book dealer. They say you can't turn lead into gold, but I'm hoping to take this book and turn it into gold. Number 2. 1890s Co-45 Peacemaker Revolver. Made them all equal. <laughs> The Colt single action army really was just incredibly revolutionary. I mean, this this was. In the season four, Rick purchases an 1890s Colt 45, which sells quicker than any old firearm. Rick's energy is discernible, particularly after the seller said he bought it for $25. In the end, they agreed on $3,000. Weapons Master Sean reveals to Wick that the firearm is worth $5,000 in its current condition, but it could be more. For example, the first made Colt 45 Peacemaker was sold for $242,000. In truth, the weapon on Pawn Star was a later model worth around two to forty-two thousand. It's a single action army, seven and a half inch barrel, which was the standard cavalry length. The single action army changed everything. I mean, this is the gun that won the West. Also known as number three, three Hotchkiss, Hotchkiss Cannon. Cannon. <laughs> what can you tell me about this thing? Well, it's an 1890s Hotchkiss Cannon. Uh, they say it was used in the Indian Wars. The seller brought this artillery piece, hoping for a big payday. Things were looking into when Rick asked his weapon master, what would I be able to pay for it and still make a couple bucks? To which he answered, I will state 40,000 throughout the day. Obviously, Toss is satisfied. However, then he quickly submits the daily imperfection of any exchange, which is to uncover his main concern number before wrangling even starts. I expect around 3,000, Hurl says, quickly reducing himself to a potential 10,000. Rick seizes the Toss' slip up and consents to 30,000 as long as the gun still shoots. It does, and they shake on the agreement. Clearly you could state, while that is simply the dealer's issue for undermining, however plainly Rick recognized what he was doing, and expertly profited by the merchant's low desires. <laughs> Alright, this is the moment of truth. If it fires, it's 30 grand. Number 4. 1984 Chris Craft Boat. I called at the shop and said he had a great lead on a boat. So I thought I'd hop on a plane, come out to Harsons Island, Michigan. What a great chance to check out a boat with Rick. See Corey takes, as in a far anyone knows, tremendous bet on purchasing a 1984 Chris Art Vessel for $16,500 before having a specialist look at it over. As has become the customary shtick of the show, Rick and the elderly person falter at the amount Corey spent how much a dangerous buy until actors later discover that it's only worth $4,000 of reclaimed work. The vessel has been reestablished to an exact retail estimation of $30,000. The most likely made for ungainly review for vendor Dino, who says he acquired a vessel for $25,000 half a year back and was looking to ideally get no under $20,000 for it from the pawn shop. It needs for somewhat more work than I can stand to return to it. Dino says not understanding that on top of the chance that he would quite recently by one way or another hacked up $4,000, he could have been taking a gander at the potential bank back of the initial investment, as opposed to an $8,500 misfortune. Boring the hell out of Spence and I. Can we just get on this thing, test drive it to even see if it works? Yeah, and I claim any of the leftover bootleg whiskey that's been there since the 20s. Yeah. Number 5. 1962 Linton Continental Today is the day we give Richard Sr. from the pawn shop his baby. She's taking a whole lot more time as we put the finishing touches on because Richard Sr., he knows... In another season 1 scene, Rick and the old man makes a take of an arrangement of a re-established 1962 Lincoln mainland. The vendor, Devin, said he did the greater part of the motor work himself. However, he's put sufficient opportunity and cash into it that he's prepared to release it. He said he needs to get 13000 to 14000 However, the Great Magnificence has to generally disregard it inside, so Devin in the long run goes separate ways with it for just 9500 Strangely, they know that the first showroom cost for the vehicle was 10000 
which means they really paid less for the vehicle in 2009 than it cost new to 1962 not typically the situation with great autos fit as a fiddle. Anyway, there's a standard hand wringing about whether the rebuilding cost would momentarily crush them. Be that as it may, they didn't. They burned through 15000 to recover the vehicle into showroom shape yet where they left with the vehicle 30000 to 35000 contingent upon the purchaser, which means that this arrangement was a potential 5500 to 10500 gain for the Pawn Stars. Birds fly over it. Okay. <laughs> After you, sir. Today is the day we give Richard Sr. from the pawn shop. Number six, Yasugutu Samurai Sword. Hey, what's up, Corey? May I take a look at your sword? Mm, there you go. It's a beauty. Wow, it looks awesome, man. Sweet. Samurais are pretty badass. Thanks. In what is likely the most grievous case of the folks intentionally coming up short for a thing, Corey sliced through an exchange on a 15th century samurai sword that might net the shop over $10,000. The merchant David professed to be an attorney who kept the sword after a customer utilized it as a guarantee at the point neglected to come back to guarantee it. Just before the wheeling and dealing began, Corey conceded by means of reserve alcove confession proof that he's seen a couple of these sell for a great many dollars, which is the reason his opening idea of 800 was absurdly obscure. The merchant woefully underprepared for the arrangement said when he offered 8000 he needed to bounce and do a move. Yet I needed to keep my cool on the ground that the value of the whole thing went up. They concurred on 1500 and a specialist later decided it'd be worth 5000 to 6000 in present condition. Be that as it may, ought to be Curry be eager to do a 3000 rebuilding, he could get as much as 15000 for it. That is a score big hoss, Chumley says as he and Corey high five. In 1863 by Nagahiro and was given to the Lord of Choshu to protect Japan against enemies of the emperor, the imperial family. Number seven, autograph screenplay for the Godfather. This is the Ghostbusters proton pack. This is a replica that I built myself. Ghostbusters was a big budget movie for its day. This one falls into the category of almost ripoff since the seller Diane didn't part with her item. A copy of the Godfather screenplay signed by Al, but we're including it here because of what a bad offer it really was. After Rick's handwriting expert John verifies that Diane's leather-bound screenplay is indeed signed by Al Pacino, Rick offers Diane 500 for it. Partially based on John's suggestion that it would probably would bring 1000 at auction. She simply leaves, saying that now that we know it's Al Pacino's signature, the fundraiser will probably get more money than that. According to the Las Vegas Sun, Diane Hutton was with Catholic Charities of Southern Nevada and obtained a signed screenplay when it was donated along with thousands of books. When she eventually auctioned off Michael Corleone's real-life John Hancock, it fetched an amazing 12000 Oh my gosh, to think those guys offered me 500 what if I had said yes, taking a 500 and run, Hudson said. But that's not even the best part. When the Godfather producer Al Ruddy got wind of the auction, he stepped forward and said that he was the owl who signed the script, making the Pawn Stars valuation wrong for an entirely different reason, and leaving their handwriting expert with egg on his face to see if somebody out there feels that this would be a collection they would like to have ownership of. I have a script of The Godfather. Okay. And finally, number eight. Baseball signed by the 1951 New York Yankees. Got a 1951 Yankees team signed baseball. It's got about 22, 23 signatures on the ball. Joe DiMaggio. Another near miss for a would-be cheated customer came when the old man threw a screwball after an offer seller clinch who showed up with a baseball sign by the 1951 World Series Championship New York Yankees. After handwriting expert Brenda compared the signature on the ball with authentic signatures he brought with her and determined they were real, she offered this helpful advice. The value of the ball is really subjective. It comes down to what the buyer is willing to pay for it and what the seller is willing to go for it. Clint had already pitched 3000 as his initial asking price, to which the old man presumably sensing the stinker he was about to send back said, I'm gonna shoot you a price if you don't like it don't hit me, but I'd be a buyer at it at $800. Clint respectfully denied and went on his way, and it's a good thing he did. In 2017, a similar ball was featured on Antiques Roadshow, only this ball was also signed by Marilyn Monroe, who later married team captain Joe DiMaggio. That ball was appraised at 15000 because it included Marilyn Monroe's autograph, but the expert value it at five to 7000 because it was missing hers. In other words, the old man swung for ripoff fences, but fortunately for customer Clint, struck out hard. And I like what I'm seeing because Mickey Mantle had two different signatures. The first signature that- And that's all for now. Stay tuned for more exciting content when we return. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos.